The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled New Horizons in EGFR Mutated NSCLC, Broadening the Impact of Precision Testing in the Context of an Expanding Treatment Landscape. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CWE860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Marie Arcella, and I am a pathologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, welcome to this educational activity focused on advances and practicalities of testing and treatment in EGFR mutated lung cancer. I am joined today by two thoracic oncologists, Dr. Solsha Petroska from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, as well as, doc as Dr. Joshua Bommel from University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. I'm looking forward to this discussion today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So detection of actionable genetic biomarkers has become a standard of care uh, for therapy selection in clinical management of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, numerous genetic alterations have been reported in this setting with EGFR and CARE as, as the most common. Uh, numerous biomarkers, however, are present at lower frequencies and the vast majority of them are below 3% and are currently uh, targetable alterations with either approved agents um, or under clinical trials. Based on the updated guidelines um, uh, that have been issued jointly by uh, the College of American Pathologists, the American Society for Molecular Pathology, and the International Association for uh, Lung Cancer in 2013 and updated in 2018, the assessment of uh, mutations for EGFR and fusions involving ALK and ROS uh, should be prioritized over other biomarkers. Um, even as, this, um, as these guidelines were being put together, um, many other biomarkers, of course, um, were evolving and the NCCN in the meantime has been continuing to update their recommendations, keeping up with the rapid emergence uh, of the evidence in response to targeted therapies for other mar biomarkers, um, even including enteric fusion, fusions, which are actually very rare. Um, with the long list of guidelines, um, then this actually supports that one should use next generation sequencing as the most practical, practical way of testing rather than performing a series of single gene assays. Um, unfortunately, despite all of the guidelines, um, the testing and the, the adoption of many of the biomarkers uh, for testing has been actually difficult. So in this study presented at ASCO in 2019 by German et al., um, there was a review of over 1,200 patients with non-small cell lung carcinoma in a community setting between 2017 and 2018. And this shows that patients um, with lung adenocarcinoma are markedly um, under genotype despite the recommendations that I already described. Uh, for this data, for example, uh, five different community oncology practices uh, were queried, encompassing 289 oncologists. And what you can see is that for EGFR testing, which has been part of the standard of care for over a decade, is still only tested in about 54% of the patients. The testing gradually decreases to the point where for all of the biomarkers that actually need to be tested based on the guidelines right now, only 7% of patients get testing for all of the biomarkers. Um, interestingly, the pd one um, immunohistochemistry as a marker is one of the assays that is being adopted and is being performed uh, much more, at much more higher rate than any of these other biomarkers except for EGFR. Um, even more sobering are the numbers of patients that are actually uh, treated with their respective agents. Um, among those that are tested and with evidence of targetable alterations in EGFR, ALK, and ROS, and, and also BRAF, 
only about 45% of these patients who have evidence of the mutation um, actually have received targeted therapy during um, any line of treatment. Um, in several U.S. and global surveys, what we actually see is that there are several that that although the markers are being tested, um, the long turnaround times, the lack of uh, molecular testing um, in the same institution, and sometimes the poor performance status of the patients actually um, lend to a very long turnaround time, which affects how many of these patients are actually receiving therapy. Um, so now focusing strictly on EGFR, which is the topic of our talk today, um, this is a marker that has become a standard of care for well over a decade now. And this is an excellent model to explore the evolution of targeted therapy, the benefits and the pitfalls, and also the barriers that are associated with targeted uh, treatments and personalized medicine. Mutations have been uh, typically associated with very specific uh, patient phenotype, usually female, non-smoker, and also Asian. However, any patient, regardless of their phenotype, um, can have these mutations and can be treated. Um, once you uh, give these patients uh, uh, therapy specifically targeted for the marker that they have, many of these patients actually develop resistance mutations, uh, which are commonly associated with um, secondary is it with a secondary genetic event that is um, that that evolves to bypass um, the initial um, the initial mutation. So. After this introduction, I would like to uh, turn uh, to the, the type of mutation. So the, the, um, the biology of EGFR is actually quite complex. Um, and at a basic level, I would like to point out that uh, there are hundreds of different EGFR mutations that have been described. However, most of the, the most common mutations are usually conglomerated um, in the tyrosine kinase domain of the gene. Uh, which is coded by exons 18 to 21. Uh, sensitizing mutations are those that are sensitive to the current inhibitors, um, and, uh, are, and these are primarily located between um, 18 and 21. Um, mutations in exon 20 are commonly described as, resist as resistance mutations, either primary or de novo or secondary to um, as those that appear after treatment with EGFR inhibitors such as T790M and C797S. Um, mutations that are present in exon 20, however, are highly variable both in sequence and in their location within exon 20 itself, which also uh, dictates that they have variable responses to the inhibitors that are being um, given, but not all of them are actually resistant. So um, with this background, I would like to turn to my clinical colleagues who will outline some of the important aspects of EGFR, of the EGFR timeline that we were talking about before. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Josh right now. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, looking at this timeline, you really can see that the field of EGFR mutant lung cancer has undergone a metamorphosis, right? This really began 2004. We identify EGFR mutations, and really, this is the start of understanding of how these work. So I pass in 2008. I actually love to think about this trial. This trial was designed before we knew that EGFR mutations were the mechanism of sensitivity to TKI therapy. So if you look at the eligibility uh, profile of IPASS, it was basically if you are Asian and haven't smoked a lot. And that identifies a lot of patients who have EGFR mutant disease. But in the retrospective, in the secondary analysis, they could say, well, wait a minute, what happened to those patients who had an EGFR mutation and did not? And you can clearly then see the remarkable effectiveness of this biomarker, such that patients who were EGFR negative, and looking back, probably a lot of them had ALK, um, plummets in gefitinib, but those who have an EGFR mutation respond beautifully to gefitinib. Then uh, with work that a lot of it came out of a uh, mass general with, Dr. With, uh, with, with Zosha's colleagues up there, uh, as well as Zosha's work herself, showing that uh, repeated biopsies allow us to understand mechanisms of acquired resistance, 
Then we had a brief time of fighting about whether it's Erlotinib, Jafitinib, or Fatinib is the best first line agent. Um, but then we started seeing more about drugs like Osimertinib. This is a third generation TKI. Um, and then also had information about Dacomitinib, another second generation. And now most recently, at ASCO this year, and now published in New England Journal, we saw the first evidence of what happens when we give these TKIs in the adjuvant space, trying to enhance the likelihood of cure to this deadly disease. So let's sort of break this down as to what types of drugs are currently approved in the management of metastatic EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. So first, let's start in the top left of this quadrant here, the top left quadrant here. These are the first generation EGFR inhibitors. You got Jafitinib, you've got Erlotinib. They're both reversible EGFR inhibitors. Um, they're approved for the first line management of EGFR uh, mutations, specifically the exon 19 deletion and L858R that are the vast majority of these mutations. Shortly thereafter, there was an approval for a Fatinib, um, and then also dacomitinib, both of those are second generation inhibitors. So what do we mean by second generation? Well, they're irreversible EGFR inhibitors. Neither of them have a great amount of CNS penetrance and neither of them have efficacy against the T790M mutation. That is the most common mechanism of resistance to erlotinib, jafitinib, and because these don't have activity there, also a fatinib and dacomitinib. Um, a fatinib specifically is not only approved for exon 19 and LA58R, but also the rarer alterations of S768I, L861Q, and G719X. Now, if you are listening to this and you are a clinical oncologist and you think that I just said a bunch of alphabet soup, do not be overwhelmed because this is really complicated. When you get one of your test reports and it shows an EGFR mutation, it is important to know what type of mutation it is to help guide the best treatment. We're going to talk about some of the data and EGFR classical mutations, and then Zosha is going to talk about these exon 20 insertions, which is a whole other type of mutation uh, with different types of treatments. Moving on to the bottom, these are the more recent approvals. Osimertinib was recently approved in the first line management of EGFR mutant disease. It is also approved in the later line management of EGFR mutant disease, harboring a T790M mutation. And most recently, there was a first line approval of erlotinib with the VEGF inhibitor uh, ramucirumab um, for the treatment of first line EGFR mutant disease. So let's take a look at the data that led to the osimertinib approval in the first line. This was the FLORA study. FLORA study randomized patients with a classical EGFR mutation to either investigator's choice of erlotinib or jafitinib, and remember those are those first generation reversible inhibitors, or osimertinib, that third generation inhibitor, which was already standard of care for T790 positive disease. These results are remarkable we saw an improvement in both progression-free and overall survival with the use of a newer pill in osimertinib. There are some more advantages to osimertinib that are not quite captured here. First of all, it's better tolerated. There's less rash with osimertinib than you have with erlotinib or jafitinib. And also in contrast to erlotinib and jafitinib, osimertinib has excellent CNS penetrance. So the incidence of brain metastases goes down substantially. And there's actually even data about osimertinib working in patients with leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. And remember, I was talking before about acquired mechanisms of resistance. Um, there is a lot of work that has been done no, looking at repeat biopsies, the use of liquid biopsies to identify mechanisms of resistance, that's how we learned about T790. We're now starting to see the first studies looking at mechanisms of resistance to first-line osimertinib, which is now the standard of care. When you look at this pie chart, what leaps out to me is that you don't have the same story we had with T790, where there's one mechanism of resistance that is overwhelming. In fact, that 40 to 50% before you get too excited, that's unknown. 
Okay, so all of the other ones represent smaller pieces of the pie. Um, and that be, makes it really complicated to guide next line treatments after osimertinib. More to come here, stay tuned. Ad Aura, this was the trial that was presented at ASCO and subsequently published in the New England Journal. This was a truly revolutionary study. Historically, we've only used these EGFR inhibitors in the setting of metastatic disease, but this study took patients with localized EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, and after surgery, after adjuvant chemotherapy at the investigator's discretion, randomized them to either uh, the receipt of three years of osimertinib or three years of a placebo. Now, one thing you have to know about the ad or a trial is its primary endpoint was disease-free survival. That's a little uncomfortable. Remember, these patients were trying to cure them. So we'd like to see an overall survival advantage, but the primary endpoint here was disease-free survival. Nevertheless, you can see that you could drive a truck through these survival curves that osimertinib clearly is associated with a marked improvement in the disease-free survival and that this benefit was more greatly highlighted in those patients who had stage two to three A disease, which is the primary endpoint and real the group that they wanted to look at. But there was also benefit even in the stage one B. There were fewer local, regional, and distant metastases with osimertinib, less incidence of CNS metastasis, so the CNS disease-free survival benefit had a hazard ratio of 0.18. This is remarkable, and it will change the way we have to think about EGFR mutations. On December 18, 2020, the Food and Drug Administration approved osimertinib for adjuvant therapy after tumor resection in patients with non-small cell lung cancer whose tumors have EGFR exon 19 deletions or exon 21 L858R mutations as detected by an FDA-approved test. The approval was based on findings from the ADORA trial. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to throw this to my colleagues. And so how do we incorporate biomarker testing into those with early stage lung cancers. Osha, why don't you tell me how, how things work up at, at Harvard? That was a great summary, Josh. Thanks. You know, I think it's a really important question. I agree with you. I think Adora is a very exciting trial that kind of changes the paradigm in how we think about testing. You know, I think we've, we've, as Maria, you nicely summarized, we've been testing metastatic disease for a long time. And frankly, even there, we don't do a perfect job. And, and in some places, far from it. And now we're just going to cast a broader net. What I hope is that that broader net will simplify things in a way. I think a lot of challenges come about from, you know, the challenges of identifying which patients should get which testing, which genes, which types of tests, which stage do they have, do they qualify for testing. And I think as we move to more broad testing, that may actually simplify things. I'll tell you at our institution, we've really worked closely with our pathology colleagues in this setting to try to streamline the testing and actually make reflex testing a part of, um, part of the testing now for surgically resected samples based on this data. And this is still a work in progress. This is fairly recent data, but we hope to move to a time when, when we see a patient in the clinic to discuss, for example, adjuvant chemotherapy and now more broadly adjuvant therapy in general, we'll actually have molecular testing and specifically the EGFR testing in hand. And, and Maria, you know, one of the things that I often experience as a clinical oncologist is that, you know, I get all excited about a trial data, and then I tell my colleagues in pathology, and they say, well, we have to bill for this. This is something that actually has to be thought about. So Maria, can you tell us how does the billing work in terms of these earlier stage disease in terms of the testing that we want to do? Yeah, so, so this, this is one of the issues with uh, why testing has not been adopted so widely, as, as widely as we would like it to be. So, um, for example, in, in our institution, we do have reflex testing and every single lung adenocarcinoma gets tested regardless of whether it is a, a, um, a, an advanced carcinoma or a resection. So in terms of testing, it's extremely difficult to test patients at the time that they have advanced disease because these biopsies are tiny and uh, they're very difficult to work with and you always end up with insufficient uh, material to be able to test. 
the idea of being able to actually test a resection with ample material is actually, um, it, it's, it's great in terms of being able to um, finally do all of the testing on these patients as broad as you may need with next generation sequencing or with additional uh, uh, um, smaller panels to be able to get the patient to, uh, to get to their therapy. However, at this point, this is not something that is paid by insurance companies. Insurance companies are going to go with what the guidelines are. And up to now, the guidelines have been based on only patients with advanced carcinoma and those patients with um, who, who are amenable to a resection and who are at lower stages of disease, these patients do not actually get uh, paid by, by insurance or they, their testing doesn't get paid by insurance. So the fact that we would have something like this where it really doesn't matter whether the patient is advanced or not would actually facilitate the testing immensely. Um, and it would help us be able to, uh, to test broadly upfront. These mutations, again, uh, once you have an EGFR mutation and you have a recurrence later on, is going to be exactly the same mutation. So it, they don't change. So, so whether you test on the advanced disease or on the, on the first sample that was the, the, that was the resection, it really doesn't matter for the patient. And it really does, is a game changer for everybody. Yeah, and you know, you, you touched on something there, which I think that I'd like to ask Zosha about here. So uh, we're going to be doing testing on earlier stage tumors, and you were mentioning, Maria, that broader testing will be easier in that setting. Zosha, how are you going to handle, you know, adopting Adora into your practice? And if you have a patient who has, let's say, an ALK in the adjuvant setting, do you think that these data should be extrapolated to that setting? Such a great question and a really important one. I think one of the challenges with ELK and ROS and some of these other rarer targets is it's going to be incredibly hard to do similar studies in those rare populations. Um, and I think, you know, what the first thing to say is there are studies ongoing. For example, for ELK, there's the Alchemist trial. And I think it's really important to try to get these patients onto those studies because it's really the only way we're going to get these answers. So that's that's the first point. For patients who don't have access to trials, you know, I would be wary at this point. I think the Adora data is exciting, but it's still early, as you pointed out. Right now, we're looking at a, at a significant, but still a disease-free survival benefit. So right now, I, I would be a bit wary to extrapolate these data to other, to other targets. However, I think if we start to see a survival benefit, if we really find that these TKIs are curing more patients, I think that then the impetus will be stronger to perhaps extrapolate to other targets where we may not be able to get direct data from those mutations themselves. What are your thoughts on that, Josh? Yeah, I completely agree. I think based on the data we have, I would definitely not extrapolate them. But I do think that if we had, um, if we had an overall survival advantage that's remarkable in Adora, then what I would favor doing would be a trial of, let's say, electinib in that space, even a single arm study just show that this is much better than we would expect, consistent with what we saw with Adora. And I think that would be enough for me to extrapolate these findings. It's gonna be an issue in terms of reimbursement. And it's gonna be a question that we as a society are going to have to answer because this is, it's a big cost. There's no denying that. Um, but the outcomes for patients with early stage lung cancer are simply unacceptable in my view. I think it'll also depend on the toxicity profiles of these various drugs when you talk about different targets. And I think you know one of the reasons this is so exciting is that osimertinib generally is a well-tolerated drug. And I was just talking to a patient in the clinic last week about this, and she said, I don't know, do I want to take a pill like this for three years? What are the side effects going to be? And yeah. what we know with osimertinib is that that generally is is you know it doesn't have a huge impact on quality of life. We at least extrapolating from the metastatic setting, but that balance may be a little bit different with other TKIs and other targets. So there's going to be a lot of I think aspects of this that we'll have to consider as we make these decisions. One other question as we, before we go on to Exxon 20, um, you know, I mentioned briefly the data about uh, ramucirumab, uh, as well as the, there are a lot of combination studies that are being evaluated in the EGFR mutant space. So first of all, do you think there's currently any role for the first or second generation EGFR TKIs, whether alone or in combination in modern management? Um, and also, what combination strategies are you excited about moving forward in the first line? It's a great question. You know, right now, outside of a clinical trial, I think osimertinib is really my preferred approach. I'm, I'm convinced by the flora data. I think, again, osimertinib is well tolerated. It has good CNS penetration. It clearly showed both a progression-free and overall survival benefit, as you nicely summarized. 
But I think we can't rest on our laurels and there's still a long ways to go. You know, a year and a half is not good enough for first line therapy. And I really am hopeful that in the future, some of these combinations are gonna change our first line strategy. You know, as you alluded to, there's a number of different combination therapy trials ongoing, um, osimertinib plus uh, chemotherapy, the FLORA2 trial, osimertinib with bevacizumab and, and other VEGF inhibitors, osimertinib and jafitinib and other kind of um, TKI, TKI combinations. I personally, I, I'm really excited about the chemo data. I think it, that data has been really compelling. You know, when you looked at some of the studies that combined first generation EGFR inhibitors plus chemotherapy, and in two different studies, one out of Japan, one out of, out of India showed a consistent improvement, not only in progression free, but also in overall survival. I think really highlighting the fact that, you know, delivering more therapy to these patients who may not always get to second line therapy may be important. And so I'm really looking forward to the results of Flora too. I hope to, you know, have that study open and put patients on. But today, outside of a clinical trial, I think osimertinib is a great standard of care. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I'm also very interested. We've been involved in the development of an EGFR met by specific antibody, amivantamab. And uh, the, some of the first line data there, I mean, there was an objective response rate in a small group of patients, but of 100%. And that is interesting to me because we know that MET is a major mechanism of resistance to targeted therapy. So I think that that's another area uh, of excitement as we move forward. Um, so I'd like to hand it off to you, Zosha, to talk, us, uh, to, talk to us about EGFR Exxon 20. Great, thanks. So I think this is a very important topic to cover. Uh, you know, if we think back to the slide, Maria, that you presented early on that showed just the complexity of EGFR mutations, I think the first point to make is we think of EGFR mutant lung cancer as, as one kind of group of mutations, one type of mutation. It's really important to get more granular than that and to recognize that these are very distinct mutations in some cases. And I think in particular, it's important to recognize the exon 20 insertions as a unique kind of entity and a unique therapeutic challenge, if you will. So if you look at the figure here, you know, it really highlights the um, exon 20 insertions within, still within the tyrosine kinase domain, spanning a section of exon 20 that covers the C helix and the loop following the C helix. And as you can see, the exon 20 insertions in and of themselves are a heterogeneous group of mutations. There's a number of different ones that have been described and together, they seem to make up up to 10% of all EGFR mutant lung cancer, recognizing that even that number may underrepresent some of these mutations which haven't been picked up by older PCR-based assays, and I think we're picking up more and more of them now with next-generation sequencing. The important thing to know about these exon 20 insertions when you find them is that historically they've been resistant to first and second generation EGFR inhibitors with median progression-free survival with erlotinib, gefitinib, and afatinib all less than three months. And I think as a result of the limited targeted therapy options for these patients, they've generally had a worse prognosis than other types of EGFR mutant lung cancer. Though I do hope that over time, this is actually gonna change as we have some new and exciting therapies coming forward for these mutations. So why are exon 20 insertions so challenging? What does this mutation really do? And I think it's, it's somewhat complex in terms of the structure of these mutations and, and it's depicted in this figure here. But the bottom line here is that the EGFR exon 20 insertions seem to push this area called the C helix into an active conformation in a different way than the exon 19 and L858R deletions, L858R mutations do it. And in a way that causes steric hindrance and has made it more difficult to basically to fit some of these TKIs into that pocket and cause effective inhibition. So when we look at cell line models and we look at different exon 20 insertions, um, as shown on the right-hand side here, you can see that this is um, looking at the, uh, the inhibitory com concentrations of erlotinib required to reduce cell viability. You can see that in, shown in the blue, the gray, and the yellow are the exon 20 insertions, and they require much higher doses of erlotinib to inhibit cell viability to basically stop these cells from growing. That's much higher than what we see in black for the exon 19 deletions. And in the clinic, what that's translated to is the fact that we can't deliver high enough concentrations of erlotinib to these patients to effectively inhibit these cells from growing and cause clinical responses. So that really explains why these older drugs haven't worked. And I think it's been very exciting to see some of the newer drugs that have been developed now that exon 20 insertions have been recognized as really their own unique entity and their own unique therapeutic challenge. So this table here summarizes some of the recent drugs that have been developed and the, the most recent data that we have available for them. I'm gonna focus here on a few of these, mobocertinib and a drug that Josh just alluded to, amivantamab. Both of these actually have FDA breakthrough therapy designation specifically for EGFR exon 20 insertions. And we'll talk about some of the data there. 
First, I wanted to mention pozoyotinib. If we had had this discussion a year or two ago, I think pozoyotinib would have been the drug that we spent the majority of our time talking about. It was a drug that in preclinical models looked like it was gonna work really well for exon 20 insertions. And even in an early study, um, it did show some promising signs of activity. But what we've seen is with larger follow-up in this study that had 115 patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions, the results were frankly disappointing. A response rate of 15%, PFS of only four months, and what we saw was that many of these patients were really struggling with toxicities. We saw high rates of diarrhea and about a quarter of patients having grade three or higher diarrhea, about a third of patients having grade three or higher skin toxicity or rash. And that tra translated to nearly 80% of these patients requiring dose reductions of pozoyotinib. And we think that that's probably, you know, in large part a, a function of why this drug has ultimately had somewhat disappointing activity in these larger groups of patients. And while studies with pozoyotinib are still ongoing, I think the, the toxicity of this drug remains a major challenge. Um, moving on to mobocertinib, I wanted to spend a couple of slides talking about the data with mobocertinib, but I think the results here are exciting and certainly something to keep an eye on going forward. So these results with mobocertinib, which I'll mention it used to be called TAC-788, you'll still hear us sometimes refer to it as TAC-788, are from a study that included 28 patients with EGFR exon 20 insertion mutation um, positive cancers. So again, a fairly small number, but what we saw among these 28 patients was a confirmed response rate of 43%. And as you can see on the swimmer's plot here on the right, a median duration of response of four, nearly 14 months and a progression-free survival of 7.3 months. And we saw 90% of patients having diarrhea and a third of them having grade three or higher diarrhea. Um, upper GI toxicities, nausea, vomiting, anorexia were also fairly common. About half of patients did have, um, have these types of side effects, although less grade three toxicities. And about half of patients had rash, although here we didn't see any cases of grade three or higher rash. And all, and all in all, about 25% of these patients required dose reduction. So this drug is not easy. We know that diarrhea, GI toxicities, dermatologic toxicities are known and fairly common side effects associated with EGFR inhibitors. But nevertheless, I think a, a drug that has shown some promising signs of activity, and in fact, now there's a first-line study comparing mobocertinib to chemotherapy for newly diagnosed exon 20 insertion positive cancers that I look forward to seeing the results of. Moving on to amivantamab, also known as JNJ372. Josh, as you alluded to, this is a um, humanized bispecific antibody that targets EGFR and MET and is being studied both in the, um, in the exon 20 space, but also in the resistant setting uh, for patients with exon 19 deletion and L858R. And as Josh alluded to, even some really intriguing and provoking um, first line data there in combination with a third generation EGFR inhibitor, lazertinib. So in the phase one chrysalis study of amivantamab, uh, there was a cohort of patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions. Here, 39 patients were included, and we saw a response rate of 36%. Progression-free survival here was about 8.3 months. So again, um, you know, data that seems to be on par with some of the competitor drugs, and certainly, you know, I think exciting to see a drug with a different mechanism of action also having efficacy for these patients. In terms of toxicity, you know, what we've learned is amivantamab does cause rash. Um, here, 72% of patients had rash, um, although generally these were low grade. And then unique to amivantamab is this um, infusion-related reaction, which is out detailed a little bit more on the right-hand side of this figure. What we see is that these are generally mild. Only a few percent of patients have grade three or higher rash. And uniquely, it seems to be really only um, most common on the first, uh, on the first infusion. Um, this is typically manifest as chills, shortness of breath, nausea, flushing. Um, it seems to improve actually with split dosing. So if you give the drug split up over the first two days of treatment, patients tolerate that much better. And as you can see here, really doesn't tend to recur. So I think this is a manageable toxicity, but one you have to warn patients about and be prepared to manage. Um, and again, both for mobocertinib and amivantamab, the FDA has granted these drugs breakthrough therapy designations specifically for exon 20 insertions. I think recognizing that in an area where there aren't effective targeted therapies, both of these drugs have shown promise. I also wanted to highlight the role of osimertinib here. We talked about the fact that first generation and second generation TKIs don't seem to work very well against these insertions. 
But in preclinical models, osimertinib, as, as you can see on the left here, does have some kind of intermediate activity. And I think one of the advantages of osimertinib is that it's a drug with a wide therapeutic window. It's quite sparing of wild type EGFR, and that lends itself well to being able to dose it at higher levels in, a, in the clinic, and patients generally tolerate that better than, than we've seen with some of the older first and second generation EGFR inhibitors. So based on this data, we ran um, EA5162, which is a um, cooperative group study that looked at the osimertinib at 160 milligrams, so twice the standard dose of 80 milligrams, specifically among patients with EGFR exon 20 insertions. This was a small study. What we saw here was a confirmed response rate of four out of 17 patients, or 24%, and a median PFS of 9.6 months. Um, generally, osimertinib was quite well tolerated. Um, the rates of, of skin toxicities and GI toxicities were, were quite modest and manageable. Um, but again, this is a small data set. And, and I think this data is intriguing enough that we hope to expand the study and learn more about the activity of high dose osimertinib for these patients. And this is another treatment option I think that'll be important to keep an eye on. Just lastly, I wanted to highlight the fact that these are not the only drugs in development for Exxon 20. This is a space where there's a lot of activity and a lot of excitement. Um, I've summarized a few of them here on the slide. So CLN081 is another oral targeted therapy um, being tested in EGFR Exxon 20 insertion patients. We've seen some preliminary results from the ongoing phase one study and seen some responses, but of course, very early days. So something to keep an eye on. Um, Tarloxitinib is an interesting drug. It's a hypoxia activated TKI that's been around for a while and preclinically was predicted to have some activity against the exon 20 insertions in EGFR. Unfortunately, the results that um, Stephen Liu just presented at ESMO this year were a little bit disappointing. There were unfortunately no responses seen among 11 EGFR exon 20 insertion patients. However, there was some activity in HER2, and I think that, that avenue is being pursued further with Tarloxitinib. And then lastly, um, another drug, BDTX189, from, this is an oral allosteric or B inhibitor, which is just now in phase one testing. So hopefully we'll see more with, of that, uh, with that drug in the near future. So with that, I'll wrap up this whirlwind tour of Exxon 20 insertions and maybe bring it back to the group. Um, Maria, maybe just to start off with you, I think one of the challenges as clinicians is that, as, as you alluded to, this is just getting to be an incredibly complex landscape with an EGFR. And I will often have colleagues that'll come to me and say, you know, I don't know what to make of this, the, you know, P774 insertion. How do I know whether this is an Exxon 20 insertion and Exxon 19 deletion? You know, from a pathology perspective, what are some of the efforts that are that are happening to try to make these reports as as easy to access and as easy as interpret for for um, you know clinicians who recognizing that they often the clinicians interpreting them are often not even lung cancer specialists but often general oncologists that are keeping up with not just lung cancer advances but many other diseases as well. Yeah, I, I, um, this is a great question. I think that I even have my own colleagues asking me questions on these reports. And as, as, as you know, the reports can be very, very difficult to look at because there is no, um, they, they are not written in a very homogeneous way. One laboratory may, uh, may, may report them in a different way, while another laboratory may have notes on where it is located. So um, there is a significant amount of effort from, um, from several societies and certainly from AMP, uh, which is the Association for Molecular Pathology, to, um, to bring some sense to the way that these reports um, are being written. What makes things even more difficult for EGFR exon 20 is that for a very long time, because, because of the technology that was being utilized, these mutations were usually being reported as insertion mutations rather than duplications, which are actually exactly the same mutations. So depending on how you report them, they could be moved several uh, bases uh, forward or or um, or before, um, so so it is sometimes difficult to know uh, where they are located. I think that the most important thing that I can say is that um, you have to, whenever you have a report, you have to be able to get back to your pathologist and say, um, can you clarify the report? And also, how do you report this at an institutional level? Rather than saying, you know, if they are located between, you know, 770 or uh, the specific locations, it's just better to have a very clear idea how they are reported from the pathologist. And when in question, you should always ask your pathologist. 
Um, and, and again, the other thing would be to make sure that the literature is actually homogeneous and to actually call these mutations um, by the specific location and by the type of mutation that, that they are, rather than uh, calling them insertions. They should actually be called um, a duplications when they are, in fact, a duplication, because then that this actually tells you exactly the location where they are. Um, I hope I answered the question. I just did. Let me know if that was sufficient. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is such an interesting area, and I think it's a it's a great answer. And you know what I'll say is that I think this is a confusing area for all of us, even those of us that work in the space. And I think many of us will often ask our you know our friendly pathologists, our colleagues, and I you know I think for everyone listening feel free, feel empowered to reach out to either the pathologist performing the test or sometimes to uh, myself or another, you know, oncologist at a larger academic center, because this is incredibly tough. We all, you know, sometimes need to phone a friend. And I think, you know, all of these resources are going to be important, particularly as it becomes more and more important to identify these and get the right patients on treatment. Yeah, I will, I will say in addition to that is that it, the, the um, precision medicine is definitely a multidisciplinary effort. It is not something that is done by the molecular lab or that it gets interpreted by a specific, it's actually something that needs to be done at an institutional level with everybody who uses the tests and does the tests in complete agreement so that things can be understood and, if they, and, and, and testing can be done appropriately. Um, so I would emphasize that again, this is a multidisciplinary effort and it has to be done at an institutional level. Absolutely, I think that's such a great point. Um, Josh, I'm curious, you know, you've been involved in many of these trials, you see many of these exon 20 patients, and maybe if we just take clinical trials off the table for a moment, you know, if you see a patient with an EGFR exon 20 insertion, you read your pathology report, you talk to your pathologist, you say, okay, this is an exon 20 insertion. What, how are you treating these patients outside of a trial? What do you think is, is, you know, the preferred approach for these patients are using chemo or using chemo IO? How do you think about this? So it's a really hard problem. And I actually am trying to do it sort of like a chess game. I'm trying to think of the next thing I want to do. And so based upon the data that, that you generated for osimertinib, for high dose osimertinib, which we can get off label based upon the approval in other settings, I have stopped using immunotherapy in the first line management of these patients. I use uh, platinum doublet, usually carboplatin and pemetrexid. Um, and then at the time of progression, if I don't have access to a clinical trial, I would tend to offer osimertinib at 160 milligrams um, because based on the data that you presented. Ideally, however, I think it's important to note these patients really do need access to these clinical trials. These drugs are very exciting, and I think that it's important for us to develop them so we can get better access around. Right now, I think it's exciting to see, you know, all of these different options. And personally, I'll say it's also exciting to see drugs with different mechanisms of action. And I think one of the important areas will be, how can we use these drugs in sequence? You know, can we, can we help patients to access more than one of these drugs as a way to, um, to you know, prolong, prolong progression-free and ultimately overall survival, but by treating them with different new targets in, in sequence? So maybe um, in the interest of time, we can move on to the last section about testing, which I think is ultimately, you know, really the bottom line here. If we don't test, we're, we're never going to be able to, to help patients get onto any of these new and exciting therapies. And then we can come back to this discussion after that. Absolutely. So I will take um, the next session, um, which is on, well, not only how to test, but also who to test and when to test. So in, in terms of who do we test? So based on guidelines right now, the like, all patients with advanced stage lung cancer should be tested um, for, for EGFR mutations, regardless of their clinical characteristics. And as I said before, usually patients who have EGFR mutations will um, um, be um, women who are Asian, who um, are non-smokers, but this is actually, while the mutations are more common in this type of patient population, there are other populations that would have a very, very high uh, number of EGFR mutations, such as um, certain subsets of Latin American populations, for example, where the mutations could actually be up to 50%, uh, as in the Peruvian population, for example. Um, so any, and, and, this, and by the same token, patients who are smokers will also get these mutations. Um, so any patient, regardless of characteristics, as long as they have advanced stage lung cancer, should be tested. 
Um, also, any patient at the time of recurrence or progression, if they were not tested prior to, um, previously, and also patients who are at lower stages, this by guidelines right now, the, the testing is encouraged, but it's actually not, uh, it is not required. However, we already talked about the interim analysis for the ADORA trial, um, which uh, gives us a very good reason to make sure that we actually test these patients at an early stage. And as I said before, it can greatly facilitate the testing um, and, and reduce the failure rate in uh, lung cancer. Um, also, in terms of um, guidelines, um, the when do, a, well, we, we talked about when do we test, but also um, how do you actually test? And the guidelines themselves don't actually tell you what is the type of assay that should be done. Uh, current recommendations are that you test by by any method, but the uh, N NGS, um, of course, is the preferred method because you would be able to test for um, all of the genetic alterations outside of EGFR that are important for targeted therapy. Um, but if that is not possible, then panels or multiplex testing is, is the best way to go. Um, the In terms of the tissue, the, uh, right now, uh, formal infects paraffin embedded tissue, cytologic material, fresh tissue. The tumor tissue itself is the gold standard for testing. And we will talk about uh, cell-free DNA in a little bit, but at this time, the gold standard continues to be the tumor tissue. Um, in terms uh, of, um, of the sensitivity of the assays that are required, so for, for specifically for EGFR, the guidelines say that you should have at least 20% tumor, um, tumor content, which means about 10% variant frequency for a, a variant allium frequency for that specific mutation. Um, this is for the sensitizing mutations. However, the sensitivity that is required for a patient with acquired resistance, for example, has to be much lower and the assay should be able to detect mutations when the tumor present is about 5% or a variant allele frequency that is around 2%. Um, and in, uh, in terms of the design, and this is where things get actually very difficult for EGFR mutations, is because there, if the EGFR, there are so many EGFR mutations and the assay to choose to be able to test them has to be one that is designed in such a way to be able to pick up any mutation that is found in the general population of lung cancer uh, in a frequency of at least 1%. And that means that many, many, many mutations have to be tested, types of mutations, and this makes the, the signing of the assays much more difficult, which brings us back to the reason why next generation sequencing is such an attractive technology to be able to assess uh, lung cancers. But to go to uh, the, the, the NGS testing, so many laboratories are broadly adopting this NGS technology, again, as a very highly attractive technology for assessment of tumor samples. But next generation sequencing has, their, has its pros and it also has its, its cons. So the pros is of course that it allows optimal tissue management and cost containment and a very broad approach that is able to uh, test for many mutations and very rare markers uh, so that you can, you can um, treat your patient with either approved agents or alternate targeted therapies under clinical trials. However, the cons are that the more comprehensive the assay is to be able to detect both fusions and mutations and the broad range of mutations that are present, that means that the, the, the turnaround time is much longer. There are also some technical drawbacks to next generation sequencing. It may alone, a single test may not provide all of the answers that are needed for timely clinical management. They also may lack, depending on the assay itself, the sensitivity that is required to be able to detect the mutations. And again, a single assay may not detect all of the markers and you may end up having to do two different NGS assays to be able to, to test. Um, importantly, not all NGS assays are the same and you may go from very, very comprehensive assays, very large hybrid capture panels to even exome sequencing. Um, to more targeted approaches that are cancer specific and even to, to the very target specific single gene assays, uh, which is the non-NGS type of, the, of testing. Um, importantly, again, um, each assay is going to have its own nuances and it is also going to change the turnaround time. So you have to really choose the assay and understand some basics of the assays um, to be able to decide on one, what test to get. 
Um, the, the issue with lung adenocarcinoma specifically is that this is the prototype of the very difficult clinical scenario, very advanced stage disease with very limited tumor material, a very wide range of clinically relevant genetic biomarkers where you have point mutations, insertions and deletions, structural changes, all of these rearrangements and fusions, and even now copy number alterations that can be, that need to be tested. And the samples themselves are not only very small, but they can be highly heterogeneous. You can have is just very, very tiny biopsies with a good amount of tumor, but a lot of inflammation, which dilutes your, 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 uh, your very allele frequency very, very fast. Or you may have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of other non-neoplastic cells that will dilute the, the, um, the specific um, tissue, but also the very, very small tissue is very difficult to micro dissect. So at a testing level, these are extremely, extremely challenging samples. So for us, for example, we do testing on absolutely everybody as they come in. And we have learned a lot of lessons, uh, a lot of lessons from our own testing. So in this slide, for example, um, this is the summary of the first 10,000 samples that we tested by MSK Impact. And lung endocarcinoma by far was one of the cancers that, that ended up with incomplete testing. Um, and this is because of the heterogeneity of the sample. So despite the optimization that we had at the time when we, when we published this report, for example, um, a lot of the samples uh, that were um, the small biopsies and the, and, and, the, and the cytology samples, which are the vast majority of the samples that you see with lung cancer, those were the ones that had um, an incomplete testing or the testing was just not, it, 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 it led to a failure. So about 75% um, of these samples are, have a success. Uh, however, you still are left with about 25% of the samples that are not, that, uh, that, that you won't be able to test or you will not be able to get as much information as you, as you needed from that. And this is at the time that we had already optimized um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the protocols. So at that time, we started um, optimizing our workflows um, at an institutional level to be able to get to the point where we could actually have a success rate on regardless of how small the sample was. So um, in 2015 and 16, recognizing that there were specific issues with cytology samples, for example, we started the optimization of our uh, procedures, which was an agreement with the entire institution from the time that the sample was, was submitted to the time that it got to surgical pathology, how those samples were cut and how those samples actually got to our uh, laboratory. And this was a huge amount of effort. Uh, and I will just, I won't go over the details, but on this slide, you have the, the, uh, the, the two publications that we put together where we showed that by optimizing the workflows alone, not even the extraction, um, we had a success rate that improved from 75% to 92% success rate for next generation sequencing. And this was for a very broad assay that was testing for more than 400 genes. Um, but even then, as I said, you know, an assay like MSK Impact, which is our, the one that we use, it takes about two to three weeks for you to be able to get a diagnosis. So we had to institute in between some very uh, some some single gene assays to be able to allow for um, for rapid uh, triaging of these patients that needed a diagnosis. So we started um, including um, single gene assays before next generation sequencing. So what we actually needed to show was that this, including smaller assays, two or three tests before you actually do your next generation sequencing would not prevent you from getting the broad analysis on those patients that required very, uh, a more uh, broad genotyping. So on this, um, we, we later published on the fact that we could, we could do rapid assays, uh, ultra rapid assays for screening of EGFR and KRAS and follow that by NGS and still have the same success on these very small biopsies. But again, you know, you still, you, we may have a success rate of 92%, which is actually very high for these very small samples, but there are going to be many patients that are not going to have enough tissue and will end up without a diagnosis. And that just brings us to whether you need plasma testing um, or not, or, um, or uh, cell-free DNA. So um, while tumor biopsies 
in terms of the the uh, the, the workflow for testing, require multiple steps where you, where the oncologist receives with uh, uh, the oncologists um, would uh, or the uh, or or the uh, radiologist would do a biopsy. The eye procedure is performed. The pathologist is going to review the um, the specific tissue, and then that goes to a molecular lab. It could take several weeks before you actually get that. While with the liquid biopsy, it is just you get the the the, uh, the uh, the blood sample, you isolate the plasma that goes to the molecular lab and you can perform the test and then you can have a diagnosis within just a few days. Um, I wanted to point out that um, when you do cell-free DNA assessment, this cell-free DNA is not only for plasma. The cell-free DNA may be obtained from any body fluid. And this is actually a very, very um, a rich source of tissue when you don't actually have a tumor tissue biopsy that is sufficient. When should you do a liquid biopsy? When the biopsy is insufficient, when the biopsy is not feasible, when the cell-free DNA that you obtain from a sample is actually more suitable than, than the biopsy itself. Um, or timing considerations when the patient just really cannot wait for that biopsy to be obtained um, or cannot actually have an invasive procedure to be performed. Um, samples of such as um, cell-free DNA from, um, from CSF, for example, are very, very good samples to be able to test and they are actually better than a biopsy itself. Um, so we are using cell-free DNA from any body fluid right now to test uh, these patients, pleural fluids, peritoneal fluids, pericardial fluids, and these actually give a very, very good result. Um, but cell-free DNA from CSF is actually superior to the biopsies. Uh, where you may have about uh, sometimes 25% of the cases uh, who get a biopsy uh, from the central nervous system would end up with no diagnosis and or a negative cytology and the cell-free DNA can actually show you mutations that are not only at a very, very high variant allele frequency compared to the biopsy or the cell pellet from, uh, from, the, from the tumor cells that are in the, in the CSF, um, but so the number of variants can also be much higher and the mean allele variant frequency will also be much, much higher. So um, there are so many details that we can actually talk about testing, but you know, obviously we're not gonna have the time to do all this. Um, so I'm just, you know, let's uh, discuss some of, the, some of the important issues. So from the oncology perspective, what do you guys think about, you know, what are the things that we as pathologists should be thinking about uh, in terms of testing and how can we overcome some of these barriers that are associated with targeted therapy? You know, maybe I'll start. I think, I think this is an area where, like you pointed out, you know, collaborative efforts are really the best way to go. And I don't just mean between oncologists, but the pathologists, but also, you know, the procedure list, whether that be the thoracic surgeons, the interventional radiologists, the interventional pulmonologists, Whoever is doing the procedure, I think this is a place where the close, more closely you can work together with all of those stakeholders, the better the outcomes. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been great to see over recent years is that I think there's been educational efforts, you know, aimed not just at pathologists and oncologists, but also at those other groups, to, you know, to try to increase the recognition of why getting this tissue is important and why working so closely together is important. And I think that's even more challenging in the community. You know, I think it's easy for us to say in academic centers where we work really closely and we have our pathologists and our radiologists on speed dial, you know, when you're in a community setting where that procedure may be happening at a whole other institution, I think it becomes a lot more challenging. So I guess the first thing I'll say is that this is just an area that's really rich and, and you know, ripe for collaboration and, and for working closely together to try to get the best outcomes for patients. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's, it's you know, the, the communication piece is one aspect of why um, having things in the community can be complicated. But, you know, when I think about reflexive testing, you know, I think that all of our institutions have reflexive testing for molecular, for molecular samples. That's not as simple as just flicking a switch and saying, oh, now we have reflexive testing. 
we had to hire a staff of people to look at the biopsies that come in, look at what testing has been done in the past to, to be a steward of that tissue to ensure it gets to the appropriate location. And that's a lot of work and it's a lot of time and it helps improve outcomes for patients. But um, sometimes we need to show our cancer centers that that also improves the bottom line. Um, but from my perspective, the bottom line is helping my patient. And there's no doubt in my mind that having reflexive testing improves outcomes uh, for getting this test result quickly. Um, and then the other step, which we spoke about before, but I think is so important, is ensuring that there is support to understand what the heck this report is saying, um, to make sure we're all speaking the same language so that the patients can benefit. Because I see all the time that I have patients come as a second opinion and either the testing was not done to comprehensively evaluate FDA approved targets or the testing was done and it's so difficult to interpret the report that the patient didn't get the appropriate treatment. That's such an important point. And I think, you know, I have that same experience too of seeing patients, you know, in consultation where the testing may have been ordered, but often, you know, it's, it's that impetus, particularly with the first line therapy that, that need to start treatment that can sometimes make it okay, the, the testing is cooking, but we need to start treatment in the meantime. And sometimes I think that can lead to decisions that aren't always in the best interest of the patient, this rush to start treatment. You know, we see this frequently in EGFR patients where um, immunotherapy may be started as part of their first line treatment without waiting, you know, the molecular testing may or may not have been sent, or if it was sent, the, the, you know, the doctor and the patient together decided to start treatment before that came back. And I think in that situation, starting immunotherapy can have significant implications for the safety of giving a TKI later on down the road. Like you alluded to earlier, Josh, you know, we know that the rates of pneumonitis with osimertinib and other autoimmune toxicities with osimertinib given after immunotherapy are significantly higher. And so I think, you know, an important point here is not just to order the testing, but also to wait for those tests to, result, to, to return and to make sure to be acting upon them appropriately. And that I think is an, an important point for the oncologist, but also something that really, you know, you have to involve the patient in that decision because if I were a patient, I'd, I wouldn't want to wait either. I'd want to start treatment as soon as I could. But I think here is a, as an example of a time where waiting for that information to make the best decision for the patient is really the, the best thing for the patient. And I think it's a really critical point when we talk about testing. Yeah, I agree. One one last thing that I that I did want to to add. I mean, from from the molecular uh, pathology perspective, is that you know within a laboratory and within pathology itself, there it, there is such huge complexity on how the tissue moves around in the laboratory. So there are, there there are many issues with batching, having to batch the test where you have to wait for additional samples for you to be able to perform the assays. Um, and this happens a lot with next generation sequencing. When you don't have a very high volume, you may have to batch the samples to an entire week so that you can run those assays. And there are also delays at many uh, points um, within the pathology department in getting the tissue being cut, getting the tissue labeled, going to the laboratory itself, triaging, and all of these things that happen. So one of the, you know, this goes back to the communication issue. If there is communication to the pathologist to say, this is, you know, these are the samples that are, that are really needed to be done um, as fast as possible and create a specific triage mechanism uh, for, for the lung cancer patients, this is actually very important. And this was one of the things that we, we concentrated on. And even then there are delays at every step of the way. So even sometimes the, the best way that we can get the diagnosis to you guys is to say, I'm going to give you a preliminary diagnosis where that is not entirely official and that, is, that it hasn't been typed, but at least it will allow you to get your patient uh, to be taken care of while that, that, while that case gets signed out and all of these other things happen in the background. Um, so communication, again, I think is the, is, is the most important thing uh, within all of the teams that are taking care of the patient. You know, I often tell my patients, I think when we have a new diagnosis, you know, we're going through the staging workup, we're going through the biopsy, and I'll actually tell patients that behind the scenes, you know, they may be seeing myself and my team in the clinic, 
but behind the team, behind the scenes, there's a whole team of doctors and staff and technicians and other people who are working really hard to get the information as soon as we can. And I think sometimes hearing that and also talking to patients about the fact that, you know, from a medical perspective, for the vast majority of patients, it really is safe and appropriate to wait for that testing to result, to be in close communication now. You know, one of the things I found actually during the pandemic is with the advent of virtual visits, I can tell a patient, I'm going to wait, I'm going to be in touch with the pathologist. As soon as I have those results back, we'll set up a virtual visit. We don't have to necessarily, you know, make a plan for you to come on my clinic day and we can, we can go over those results as soon as they're available. I think that's really helped patients to feel, you know, more comfortable and um, in waiting, but I think it really requires that that team effort. That's so critical here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, so I, I think that we have run out of time. We could talk for hours um, about this. There are so many little things that really need to be done. Um, but this ends our educational activity for today, highlighting recent progress and best practices in genomic testing and targeted therapy of EGFR mutated lung carcinoma. Um, I hope that you all found this content uh, to your liking and that our discussions were informative and useful to your practice. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to all the faculty who uh, joined us as well. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CWE860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC, and Takeda Oncology. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.